All right, so I think we're going to get started. Um, thank you guys so much for taking the time out of your morning and joining us today. Um, I'm Tina Hansen. And I'm Elizabeth Berry. And we're going to be talking about assistive technology, what it is and how you guys can use it with your students or your child. We have a lot of material to cover today, so we might whip through this a little fast, um, but we're trying to cram in a lot into one hour. So we do have a couple of handouts for you guys. Uh, one of them is the PowerPoint and the other one is a supplemental handout. So there are a lot of tools listed on that second handout and unfortunately we just aren't going to have enough time to get through everything. But that's my microphone, sorry. Um, but that's there for you guys to explore on your own. Uh, we'll demo a couple of items from each category, and if you guys have questions along the way, please feel free to just stop us and we'll tackle any questions you guys have. A couple of quick tips for um, a great live stream. Um, the volume is defaulted at 50%, so if you are having trouble hearing us or things are really quiet, try increasing the sound um, within live stream. And if you're still having difficulties, you might want to try using a headset that might increase the sound quality. Also too, we have a lovely moderator, Bridget, who will be there to answer any questions, clarify something, um, point you to the right direction for handouts as well. So if you guys wanted to chat with Bridget, um, there is a little chat option down at the bottom and you can post a quick message or ask a quick question. All right. So really quickly, we did want to talk about the Pacer Center. Uh, we're a nonprofit organization and we're modeled on the foundation of parents helping parents. So a lot of fam or parents, people who work here at Pacer um, actually have children who have disabilities themselves. So they have navigated the K through 12 school system with their own child, which really gives a firsthand experience on um, guiding parents through how to advocate for their child and get them the supports that they need to be successful in education. Uh, we started out as a really small organization um, and we have now blossomed into over 30 different programs here at the Pacer Center. A couple of the noticeable ones are the National Bullying Prevention Center where we educate people on the effects of bullying, um, what you can do if you're being bullied, um, and handing out information about resources uh, for parents, teachers, and students. We also have our puppet program which goes into schools, mostly elementary schools, and educates kids on how they can include children who have disabilities and what it means to have a disability as well. The Simon Technology Center is one of those 30 different programs and we are really dedicated to making technology more accessible to people who have disabilities as well as um, showing people how technology can support them in their everyday lives. So a couple of core services that we do provide are um, our lending library. So it's kind of like your public library where people can borrow technology from us for a four week period. And it's a really great opportunity to try technology out before you go on to purchase it. Uh, we just want to make sure that people are making um, decisions that are right for their student and hopefully that technology is continuously being used versus just sitting on a shelf collecting dust or in a landfill. Um, another component to our services too are our free technology consultations. So with the technology consultations, um, Parents and students can come in and sit down one-on-one -on -one with a specialist here and we walk you through different options of assistive technology that are available to support the student or child. This does differ for, from a formal assessment so we can't formally recommend that someone uses a specific tool or device but we can at least show you the options that are available. We've also taken over the internet as well so we do have a Facebook page uh, we have Pinterest boards that are full of different technology resources, um, a list of technology tools that you can use. Uh, they're all divided into categories as well. We also have a YouTube channel that highlights um, different individuals with disabilities uh, using assistive technology. Um, we also have some promotional videos too, just in general for Pacer. Um, and then if you are interested in what we have to offer and what's available in our technology resource center, um, my turn is where we catalog all of our inventory. So you can go through, browse through it. It's all divided by categories, it's searchable. So if you are interested in uh, seeing what's available in our inventory, feel free to hop on there and check that out. 
All right. So we've already tackled uh, the Pacer Center and the Simon Technology Center and the rest of the day, or hour I should say, um, is really going to be spent on focusing on what is assistive technology. We'll walk you through different categories that are available and give you guys some quick demos on a few items from each category. And then last but not least, we do want to talk about the consideration process as that is a pretty important mm -hmm. part of this. Um, and then the end, we'll just tackle extra resources uh, that might be available in your area as well. All right. So when we think about assistive technology, assistive technology actually has two components, um, the devices and the tools or the stuff um, that you think of when you th um, hear the word technology and things like that. But it also um, has a service component um, as well. So. Um, legally, uh, assistive technology is defined um, by IDEA, um, special education law, as any item, piece of equipment, or product that is either purchased commercially, modified, or customized to increase, maintain, or improve the functional capabilities of a student with a disability. And that can be quite a mouthful, but we like to think of it as anything um, that can help an individual do something that they couldn't do without it. And so within um, the devices, there are a wide range of devices, many, many devices. Um, there is, they all fall kind of on a continuum of technology. So they can be um, no technology, they're very simple, um, no batteries, things like pencil grips, um, up to a little more sophisticated, but still pretty um, low um, sophistication for low tech items. And then medium tech items start to incorporate batteries, like a switch toy here that you press the switch, and then the toy activates. And then um, all the way up to high tech things like tablets and computers and power wheelchairs, more kind of what you think of when you think of high technology. And so then the service piece um, is defined legally as anything that helps in the selection, acquisition, or use of uh, an assistive technology device. So whether it's providing information about devices, um, where you can buy devices or how you can fund um, devices, especially the more expensive devices. And then a very important part, how you use the device. How can you train individuals who are working with a student? What happens if you need technical support? How do you contact people and things like that? And real quick, before we dive into kind of the stuff that we're going to look at today, we wanted to just highlight some um, current trends in assistive technology and that things are becoming uh, much more portable and smaller and real mainstream. Because if you think about um, tablets and smartphones, they have lots of capabilities built in that can help um, individuals with a disability. So it's much more um, easier to, to acquire. In, some cases. <laughs> um, but then with all of these trends, the challenge can be that things are so readily available that I can just go to the store and get something, but that doesn't mean that I know how to use it. So if I just go to the Apple store and buy an iPhone and I've never used a smartphone before, I might need some help figuring out how I could um, use it to best meet my needs. Um, and that with all of these different devices, there are multiple platforms available, so we need to learn um, different platforms, and there are just lots more options, so that consideration piece, which we'll talk about, um, becomes very important. Mm -hmm. And so, um, as we mentioned, assistive technology is a very broad category, but today we're going to highlight um, these categories that are on your slide here. Um, and within each category, there's they fall in the continuum that we talked about earlier, but there's also many, many um, tools that can fall under each of these categories. And like Tina mentioned, we only have an hour today, so we're going to demonstrate one or two per category, but please know that there are, um, we intend this to be a starting point for your exploration and that can kind of guide your next steps. Mm -hmm. So the first category that we wanted to talk about is daily living aids, and this really can range from a wide variety of different tools that are available. So it really just depends on where an individual is hoping to get more support so that they can be a little bit more independent. So a couple of examples um, that we have on our slide is uh, tools to help with eating, um, dressing, anything executive function related as well. So I'm actually gonna switch this over really quick. 
So the first one that we wanted to show you guys is actually a pretty unique tool. Oh, thank you. <laughs> so this one is called uh, the Liftware Spoon. And with this, if I can, oh, oh my gosh, we'll get it. Um, so this one, it actually is used for people who have a tremor. And this is kind of hard to see since it's rotating, but you know, I might actually hold this up instead. So you can kind of see that it bends as you move it. So for people who have a tremor and they have a hard time keeping a spoon or a fork um, level so that they can actually eat, this kind of compensates for that. So as you're moving, it kind of moves with you and tries to balance out that uh, movement or tremor. So this one again is called the Liftware Spoon. And I believe the price on this one is about a little under $200. They do have two different versions. There's a spoon and then there's, um, is there a fork one too? I believe so. Yeah, so there's a couple of different options um, in terms of which one you get. And then another one that we have is called the Time Timer. A lot of people have seen this one. Um, they make a couple of different versions. There is a standalone device like this one, and then there's also an app built for an iPad, um, and I believe there's an Android version for that. I believe so, and I could also get it on a smartphone as well. Yeah, um, so with the time timer, it's more of a visual representation of time. So you could say to one of your students, you have 50 minutes to complete your reading assignment. And as time goes on, this red portion is going to get smaller and smaller and smaller until it gets all the way to zero. And this one is an auditory alarm. So it was probably really hard to hear, but once you hit zero, it does have a little beep that lets the student or individual know that time is up and it's time to transition or move on to the next task. So this one is more of a visual representation of time versus looking at a clock and having to figure out you know, how many minutes you have um, to complete a task. So this one again is the time timer. And I know that was really fast, um, but we do have a lot that we need to cover today, so. All right, so the next category is mobility and positioning, and these are um, tools that help individuals um, be more mobile if they're um, not able to walk or something like that, then also positioning, um, whether it be in a chair or in a wheelchair or, or things like that. So within mobility and positioning, there are wheelchairs, there are gait trainers, um, which an individual can use um, to help them walk, as well as a walker um, and then a stander um, to um, be able to spend some time in that um, standing position. And then there are also positioning aids. So on your slide there, um, the blue chair is called a special tomato chair. Um, and that can be a way for an individual um, to have some seating support um, if they're, they need it. But there are also some other um, positioning supports. Um, this is a balance wedge. So this is something that I could put on my chair and then sit on it if I needed um, some support um, while I was sitting in the chair. Um, and it also has a bumpy side um, and then a smooth side as well. So if I wanted some sensory input, um, if that was helpful for me to pay attention, um, I could sit on the bumpy side and then I could also, kind of like a stability ball or a yoga ball, also um, wiggle back and forth um, that way. And then um, we have um, kind of a cool um, chair here um, in our library. This is called the Vidget Chair. Um, and this is cool. This is, uh, comes in different sizes, so this is the toddler size, um, but it comes all the way up to an adult size. But when you sit in it, um, it's hard to see because I'm holding it up, but you can wiggle back and forth. The chair rocks from side to side. And then within these little, um, oops, sorry about that, hand holds, there are some bumps for sensory input. But then um, it's modular, so I can also turn it into a stool as well. Need some help? I don't drop it, um, a table as well. So it can be um, kind of a nice way to get um, some positioning supports um, in the classroom or at home as well. Mm -hmm. 
All right, so recreation um, is another big category that has lots of different parts to it. Um, so some of the pictures that you'll see on the screen um, is the alternate spinner on the far left there that can be um, a way to um, introduce some games or have some um, input and um, participation in that. So you can push the switch and the spinner will spin. Um, there are things like adaptive bikes as well as adaptive arts. So you can participate and draw um, pictures and things like that as well as um, the adaptive paint brushes um, and other art tools that are on the bottom right there. But then, let's switch this over here. Also have um, ways that you can adapt just a regular marker. So this, this tool that's on this marker is called the Easy Hold, and they come in different sizes so that they have different um, sized openings that can fit around different things. So this one I've just put on a regular marker, but then I can take my hand, and if I had a child size hand, this would work <laughs> better, but I don't. Um, and then I can grip the marker this way. So if I don't have the fine motor ability to hold um, a marker like this, I can just grasp it this way and then um, color that way. You can also use easy holds to make it easier to hold toys. So this is the baby bottle um, that I might be using um, to feed a doll. But again, I can just slide my hand in there and then I can play um, with the bottle and feed the baby um, that way. And then um, another big part of um, the recreation category is that there are a lot of toys that have been adapted to um, be activated with a switch so that um, individuals with disability who, disabilities who might not be able to interact um, with toys by using their hands can then use the switch. So this it, toy is called Elliot Elephant, and I have him um, attached to a jelly bean switch here, and I'm gonna have Tina push the switch. And so he sings a song, and, then, and if she pushes the switch, it stops again. So it's also a great way to teach uh, cause and effect that I do something and something happens and then I push the switch again and it stops. Mm -hmm. Oops. I knew that was gonna happen. <laughs> All right, okay. now Tina's gonna talk some about environmental controls. So environmental controls is kind of a beast of a topic, but um, there's a variety of different ways that an individual can interact with their environment. So when we talk about environmental controls, there are things that are directly plugged in, such as the power link. Oh, let me take this guy away. Oh, oh thank you. <laughs> so the power link is more of a wired environmental control. So essentially what it does is you do have to plug it into an outlet but this device has two outlets built in. So you can plug in two um, different appliances like a lamp or a fan, um, something like that. And essentially what it does is it allows an individual to plug in a switch and then turn on that lamp or fan with a switch. And what's kind of nice is that you get to choose how you're interacting with it too. So if you wanted to be able to press the switch once and just have the light turn on and stay on, you can program it that way. If you wanted to have it just press and hold and then turn the lamp on and once you let go of that switch, it would turn the lamp off. Um, you can also set it as a timer too. So you could have um, you, your power link programmed and let's say you wanted the lamp to stay on for 30 minutes when you press your switch. So you can uh, program it time-wise as well, which is kind of nice. So this one is called the power link. That one, again, was an example of a wired environmental control. And then there are things that are wireless. So this one is called um, the Belkin Wemo switch. So what you do is you plug this into an outlet, just like you would with the uh, power link. But with this one, um, it has its own smart outlet, so you can control this with an app either on your tablet or your smartphone, 
and you can use the app to turn the device on and off. So if this was, um, or if this had a lamp plugged into it, you could use that app on your iPad or uh, smartphone, and you can turn that lamp on and off, which is kind of nice. This one does require wireless internet, though, so I would say that's the tricky part, is kind of getting it all connected. Um, as we all know, wireless internet does not always like to cooperate with us, so sometimes the setup on these uh, is a little time intensive, but once it's up and running and everything is connected, they work really well. Another example of an environmental control, which a, a lot of people have heard of, um, would be something like Alexa or the Amazon Echo. Um, that's very similar to what we saw with the Belkin switch, except with that, you get to control multiple devices. So sometimes people have set up like smart thermostats with them, um, light, lamps, lights, smart bulbs, things like that, and all of that is uh, controlled with your voice. So you could say, Alexa, turn on the SCC light or turn on the living room light and it would automatically turn on for you. So it just kind of depends on what type of control you're looking for um, and it really depends on the individual. But the whole goal is to be able to in interact with your environment um, with the way that best suits you. So there are a lot of uh, different environmental controls to consider um, and these were just a couple of them. So the next category that we're going to take a look at are sensory aids. And so these include um, some tactile toys and fidgets that can um, help give some sensory input. So we have a couple um, here on the slide with the klush ball and then the fidget, pa fidget pack, I believe it's called. It's, I know it's on your handout. Um, but then there are also things that you can use. Let me switch your view here. Um, thing like this is called the yucky ball and it's the transparent version and so that this one um, I can use and I can push the balls around with my fingers um, and receive some sensory input that way if that's something that's um, calming for an individual and I like this one because it's pretty quiet it doesn't make a lot of noise so I can pay attention um, and so um, get some sensory input that way Um, and so, and then the next um, thing that I'll show you before we switch the view back is this is called the Puppy Hugs, and I don't believe this one is on your handout, but it's from um, Grandpa's Garden. It's an online uh, vendor, but the nice thing about this one is this is a weighted item so that um, I could put it around my shoulders or put it on my lap, um, and then I could have um, the input from the weighted um, part of this can be calming for individuals. Um, and this one is nice because it's a puppy and so that can be um, attractive to some people. Um, and if we go back to the PowerPoints, we can look, um, there's examples there of a uh, weighted vest that an individual can wear um, and gets um, similar input to the puppy hugs. Um, but then there are also tools that can help um, for auditory sensory input so that um, the little boy in the picture is wearing noise canceling headphones so that if um, the noise in the environment is too much or too stimulating, um, you can wear those headphones to dampen that. And then um, the picture of the classroom there, they have um, covers on the lights so that you can um, kind of soften the lights in the classroom if it's too bright for some individuals. All right, so the next category we want to talk about is vision and hearing. Um, there are a variety of different tools to help support someone who may have low vision. So the first one is uh, the pebble. Let's make this bigger so you guys can see it. Okay. So the pebble is a high definition magnifier. And this might not show up the best on your guys' screen, um, but what I really like about it is that it does have a built-in stand. So if you had an older adult that might need help um, reading pill bottles, you could actually set the pill bottle right in here, have it lay flat, and then use the magnifier to um, 
be able to read the pill bottle. Um, people have also used this for grooming as well. So like if you were clipping your nails, you could set your magnifier up on the stand and then position it so that you could be able to see your nails as you're clipping them. Um, so there's a variety of different ways that you can use this. Um, of course, you can use it for reading. Let's see. And you can also change the magnification. So if I hit this plus sign, it's going to get, oh, that's as big as it gets. So if I hit the minus sign, it should get smaller for me. You can also change the contrast as well with this button on the left. So um, I believe you can also take pictures with this. So if you wanted to take a quick picture of your document, oh, 20, 90, I'm looking February 27th. wrong button. But now we know what time it is. <laughs> And that's actually the wrong time, so. And the wrong date. Yeah. <laughs> so we need to reprogram that. Um, but you should be able to take pictures as well and then zoom in and out to better see the text that you're reading. Um, so this one, again, is called the Pebble HD, and it's sold by Enhanced Vision. Can I give that one to you? Awesome. So not only do we have vision aids, but we also have hearing aids. Um, and this one is called the Wear Locket. I'll take this paper off so you guys can see this a little bit better. So the Wear Locket has a magnet and it actually just clips to your shirt or you can uh, clip it to your pants. But what's really nice about it is that it's super small, but it's really powerful. So it amplifies sound um, and I think it has a range of like 10 to 15 feet. So. Um, you can plug in these headphones, which are pretty discreet as well, which is also a nice feature about the wear locket. And so when, you're, um, when you plug the headphones in, the device turns on, you put the headphones in, and then you're able to hear amplification of sound around you. Um, so with this one, um, it is a little bit more discreet than some of the other uh, personal amplifiers that are available. Um, the Wear Locket is about $175, so um, it's a little bit more expensive, but uh, when you're looking at like vision aids and hearing aids, you can really start to get some expensive technology. So this one is fairly affordable uh, compared to other devices around. So we'll switch back to our PowerPoint really quick. Um, there are things like captioning. So uh, there are a variety of different devices that will allow for captioning where it's going to transcribe um, what's being said, which is great for students in a classroom who may have um, hearing impairments. And then you also have refreshable braille displays. Um, unfortunately, we don't have any of those devices in our technology center, but a really great resource to learn more about refreshable braille displays would be state services for the blind. Um, and then we're going to talk about alternative access next. So a lot of times um, we need to figure out a different computer setup for people who have disabilities if they aren't able to use a traditional mouse or a keyboard. And that's where alternative access comes in. And now that a lot of people are using tablets as well, uh, we're finding that you know, alternative access also applies to smartphones and tablets. So there are a variety of different types of tools that are available to help support individuals who may not be able to type on a traditional keyboard or need a different type of mouse to be able to navigate a computer, as well as different types of tools that will help um, with accessing a tablet and a smartphone. So the first one that I wanted to show you guys is this um, joystick mouse called the Enabler. And it's got a nice big joystick um, to help navigate or move the mouse around. And then your right and your left click buttons are right up here. And what's really nice about this is that they're indented, so it's really hard to accidentally press them. Um, a lot of times people who need a, uh, an alternative mouse have a really hard time with the clicking aspect of it as well. So this just prevents accidental mouse clicks that might happen when you're using a mouse. This one also has a really nice large base. So it takes away the need for having to move your hand around the desk. Instead, it's all stationary and you just move the joystick. It does have a little bit of a curve to it too, so that can kind of help position the wrist as well or give it more support since your whole hand 
is kind of resting right on that base. So this one is called the Enabler Joystick. Thank you. This one, I'm actually going to switch to my iPad. So another part of alternative access is switch access. And this switch is called the Bluetooth. It actually has two switches built into it. So you have the white and the orange one, or right and left. Um, and you also have the ability to plug in two external switches. So if you have an individual who um, is using a proximity switch or a head switch, and it's positioned um, somewhere where you couldn't position this Bluetooth switch, um, you could plug those in, and then this Bluetooth just acts as a switch interface, and it allows your switch to talk to your tablet. Um, this one is made by AbleNet. It's Bluetooth, so it's all wireless, which is really nice. I would say the downfall of Bluetooth switches is that they sometimes tend to drop their connectivity, so keep that in mind as well as you're exploring um, Bluetooth switches. But they do um, or make uh, wireless, or not wireless, wired switch interfaces as well that are sometimes a little bit more reliable. There is another device on your PowerPoint that I do want to mention before we move on to the next section, and that's the um, Toby eye gaze or any eye gaze device. So that again provides alternative access by tracking eye movement instead of physically having to type on a keyboard or having to move a mouse on the screen with um, your hand instead. These eye gaze devices actually track your eye movements so you could do email, Facebook, social media. Um, it's just a different way of interacting with your uh, computer. So. All right, the next category we want to take a look at is communication um, and this is like all the rest of the category, is a very broad category and full of lots of um, technology. But you have things such as picture symbols, which you can use um, to communicate, you can um, tell someone what you want. There are also single message devices, um, like the Big Mac here, um, that I can program and record my voice so that when I push the button, More. I can um, say my message. So I've programmed this one um, to say more and then just put the picture of more on here as well. Um, and then um, there are also some more medium tech voice output devices, um, such as the picture of the super talker on the top right there. And this device, um, I still record my messages, but it allo um, allows me to have um, change the grid size. So I can have either one message two messages, four messages, or eight messages, and so that when I push the picture of um, the button that I want, um, I will have recorded um, the um, auditory message that I want um, to communicate. And then there are also um, many high-tech voice output apps and devices, and so um, the app screenshot on your um, PowerPoint is the app Lamp Words for Life. Um, but I'm actually going to show you um, a high-tech device here that I'm going to switch to the camera. So this um, is the Accent 1000 um, by Pranky Romic Company, um, and there are various um, device manufacturer companies um, as well as page sets um, within each device, so there's um, lots of variation that you can do, but with this high-tech device, um, I have, I can t press a word, like, like here. Like. And then it will speak my message. So it gives me um, ability to have a voice and to have, um, be in that conversation and, so, and that I don't, something that I don't have to program, um, like the Big Mac that I showed you or the Super Talker. Um, that um, auditory piece is done uh, by the tablet and the, Do you want me to start off academics? Okay. So academics in and of itself could be a whole workshop. Um, Any of these categories yeah, could be. <laughs> that's true, yeah. So when we talk about academics, we're mostly talking about reading, writing, um, and math. And there are just a variety of different supports to help students. 
and that can really range from low-tech devices to high-tech devices. So some of the low-tech devices that are included could be something like um, Bright Lines paper, which is that yellow and white paper that you see on the slide. And that helps kids differentiate between you know, the top of a line and the bottom of a line so that they're correctly forming and placing their letters as they're writing. They also make something called raised line paper as well. So all of the lines on the paper actually have raised lines, which gives a tactile element to the paper and also helps students as, guide them as they're doing their writing. We do have a variety of different apps as well that also help with reading and writing. Oops, I'm gonna just wanna make sure that you guys can see this okay. So the first app that I wanted to show you guys is called CoWriter. And CoWriter provides word prediction as students are writing. I love so as I type, I get um, words that populate for me. Oh, and you can't really see that either. There we go. So as I keep typing, these words might change. Um, and what's nice is when you see the word that you want, this. you just tap on it. This. And you can continue write your writing. Okay. So, with this, this helps with a couple of different things. It's providing word prediction, which really helps kids with spelling. <coughs> Bless you. Sorry. <laughs> so if they um, have a hard time with spelling, this can really help support them so that they're not so frustrated when completing their writing or when they're getting stuck on the spelling aspect of it. Um, so that helps with that piece. But you also have text-to-speech with it as well. And with text-to-speech, it just provides an auditory support so as students are writing, they can hear what their written work is sounding like. So if you hit the speaker button right up here. I like the St. Louis blues. This is pretty. It will read everything out loud to you. So that also really helps with that editing piece of writing. So instead of relying on somebody else to read their work or um, struggling through reading this on their own to make sure that it sounds okay, they have that auditory support with text-to-speech so that they can do that independently. Another aspect of CoWriter, too, is topic dictionaries. And I believe there is a new version of CoWriter that is, um, I think they call it CoWriter Neuron, that kind of takes away the need for topic dictionaries. Um, this one in our co-writer, it's still showing us topic dictionaries, but essentially what topic dictionaries do is they allow um, you to tailor that word prediction specifically to the topic that a student is writing on. So if they had to do a paper on George Washington, they could turn on that topic dictionary and then the words would be predicted that are specific to George Washington. So it might have, I don't know, US Constitution in there um, and different words that have to do with it. Uh, with CoWriter Neuron, supposedly it takes away for the need to turn those topic dictionaries on. So it's actually being one step smarter and um, looking at the content of your writing and seeing, oh, you're writing on George Washington. So here are some words that it thinks um, you might use in your writing. I haven't played with CoWriter Neuron yet, so if any of you have, drop us a note and let us know what you think, because I think that's actually pretty cool that it's um, staying one step ahead of you and trying to look at your writing and guess what you're writing about. So. And one more thing that I, also, I really like about CoWriter is that if we go back to our writing here, um, that these, not only does it give you word prediction, but if you are writing um, and you weren't sure what, um, how to spell the word that you um, came up with, but you knew it started with the word T, um, then you can also swipe across these words. But T. But. Um, and it will um, give you a uh, text-to-speech of each word before you even put it in. So that if I go across this one, and. oh, that's the word that I want, then mm -hmm. I can tap it and. again and it will put it in. Yeah. Okay. So that one was CoWriter. Um, another app, is it? Oh yeah, it is dark. Um, 
Let's see if we can make this brighter for you guys. I think that's a lot better. Okay. Um, the next app is called Voice Dream Reader. And Voice Dream Reader is a, an app that supports students with their reading. So there's a couple of different ways that you can use this. You can actually connect it to your Bookshare account and um, you can download your Bookshare books into Voice Dream Reader and then have Voice Dream Reader read it out loud for you. You can also get text from your web browser. So if you were doing research for a paper or a project, you could import a website or a web page and have it read out loud to you as well. But there are some really nice features in Voice Dream Reader that I particularly like. So one of them is text-to-speech. And the text-to-speech on this one sounds pretty good. Um, so here's a sample. Mr. Bennett was so out of mixture of quick parts, sarcastic humor, reserve, mm -hmm. and caprice. That you do have the ability to change some of these settings as well. So if you go up to this little sound button, you can slow down or speed up the rate of speech. You can also change the voices. So they do have you know, quite a few voices that are built into this app. Um, but if you want to get really fancy with it, you can purchase more voices. And there's just tons of voices that you can choose from. Um, I think it's kind of funny when kids do the chipmunk voice. Don't know why you would want to listen to a, or a book <laughs> in chipmunk voice, but um, it's just kind of silly. <laughs> But what's kind of nice too about these voices that, is that you can play a sample of them before you go on to purchase it. So that way you know if it's a good voice or if you like the voice um, before you purchase it. So there are a couple more visual features too that you can change. So with this, um, you can change the font. And a couple of uh, noticeable fonts that I do want to point out is the dyslexy font and the open dyslexic font. And with these ones, it's a little hard to see, kind of beef this up a little bit, but um, both of them are weighted. So they're thicker on the bottom and then thinner on top to help with letter reversal. So when you're playing around with some of these visual settings, the goal is really to um, make the text stick out a little bit more from the background, making it easier to read. And there are a couple of different settings that you can change with this. And one thing I'll mention about both of those fonts are open source fonts, and so you can um, Google them and you can download them so you can use them in other things besides Voice Dream Reader yeah. as well. Yeah, that's great. <laughs> so you can also change the spacing of this as well. Um, so when you're changing the spacing, you can increase or decrease the line spacing. Um, you can increase and decrease the margins or how much spacing is in between each of those letters as well. So all of these settings are very individual preference. Um, it, I would say play around with it to see you know, what works best for the student or child that you're working with. Um, but again, the whole goal is to make the text easier to read. So you can change the color of the text as well. You can get really funky with this. So you could do like a blue background, right? And then you could go back and change the text maybe to yellow. Oop. You can have magenta text, you could have magenta okay. background, lime green. So again, it's just finding what works best for the individual. A couple of other things that I really like about this app is if you tap and hold on a word, um, you do get a couple of additional options. So you can highlight text. Maybe the teacher said, um, Mr. Humphrey was a really important character in this book, so make sure you remember him. You could highlight certain parts of the text that have to do with Mr. Humphrey. You can get a definition. You can write notes to yourself within the text as well. And when you do any of those, they all collect and appear down here at the bottom. Um, it's the symbol with the three dots and then the lines. So over here you get um, a collection of all of your highlights um, and any bookmarks that you create. And I believe your notes will appear right within the text. So if I had a note right there, I would get, oops, I didn't save it. But it should have like a little box that pops up and tells you, oh, you have a note here. So there are a lo lot of nice features within Voice Dream Reader um, that I think help support students. So. Do we have time for one more? I think so. Okay. Maybe quick. 
Yeah. Um, do you have a favorite app that you like to show? Okay. <laughs> um, let's do a math one since yeah. we did reading and writing. So we'll go to mystery math. This is one of my favorite math apps. This is called Mystery Math Museum, um, and there's also Mystery Math Town as well. I believe the app developer is Artig, A-R-T-I-G Studio. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so this one is really fun for students. Um, I think with this, sorry, navigating, um, you can choose what skills you're working on. So depending on the student that you're working with, uh, maybe they need more support in addition or subtraction, you can kind of narrow down what that student is specifically working on and the number sets as well. So if they really need to work on you know, subtraction 11 through 20, you could turn on just that one. If you really want to get tricky too and help with their critical thinking, um, you can include dice and tally marks uh, so when you're collecting numbers, it would have like the actual numerical value or it could have a dice or a tally mark. Um, and that just makes them think a little bit more about uh, some of the number sequences that they're doing. So the whole goal of this app is there are fireflies scattered all throughout the museum and these different buildings and you need to solve uh, math problems in order to move through the different rooms and the houses. And then the goal is to rescue the fireflies uh, that are scattered throughout this town. So I'll just give you a quick sample of this. So what you'll want to do is collect all of these numbers. And if you tap on a door or a window, it's going to ask you a math problem. And then I move through the next one. And I'll collect all of these. So from here, I can move up the stairs, or it's kind of cut off, but there is a door over here, so I think the stairs sound pretty good. So this is just a really fun app for kids. Um, some of it too, like if you tap on some of the objects, they'll do a little sound or jiggle. So it's very interactive um, and it's putting math in more of a game-like format. So that way students kind of forget that they are actually doing and learning math. Um, so it becomes a little bit more fun and engaging for students. Okay. All right, so back to the PowerPoint. We've kind of wrapped up all of our tech demos. So the last part that we wanted to talk about with you guys is really the consideration process for assistive technology. So one of um, the biggest factors with this is uh, the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act, which was signed um, into law into 1975. And it's essentially the federal uh, special education law that outlines the types of services or supports uh, that students with disabilities are entitled to. A big component of that is the fact that schools do have to um, consider assistive technology and how that can support an individual. And all of this ties back to making sure that students with disabilities are being able to access a free and affordable public education. So the only thing with this is that when we say you have to consider <laughs> assistive technology, the consideration part is not defined by law. So generally we're hoping that um, IEP teams have you know, a conversation um, about assistive technology and what types of supports um, that student could really benefit from. But generally, this is just a brief process during that annual IEP or IFSP meeting. So what is an IEP? We do have two parts of this. So one of them is the IFSP and one is the IEP. The IFSP is the Individual Family Service Plan, which is for kiddos birth to two years old. And then an IEP, or an Individualized Education Plan, is for kiddos uh, three to 21. So essentially an IEP outlines the type of special education services um, or related services that the student needs in order to um, be supported in their education. 
And all of this is really based on information that has been gathered either through assessments or evaluations. And we're kind of looking at you know, the current level of the student and setting goals for where we would like them to be um, throughout the year. So this is reviewed annually. Um, and it's a written record of those types of services and the decisions that this IEP team has made based on this child. So another component of this is that when we're thinking of the consideration process, we never start with selecting the tool. Um, we always look at the student and their needs first. So a lot of times we actually see parents coming in and they say, you know, we've um, purchased an iPad. How can we use this with their, our student or our child? And this is sort of a backwards approach. So what we are actually going to do is use what's called the set framework. And this looks at the student, the environment, the tasks, and the tools. Oh, and we do have a question coming in. So our question is, what are the names of the last two apps you showed in the academic category? So the last two, uh, the math app was called Mystery Math Museum. And then the one before that was called Voice Dream Reader. Uh, so going back to the set framework, what we're going to do is first look at the student. So what are their preferences? Um, who are they? What do they like? And then we're going to look at their environment. So where would they be using this tool? Would it be used at school, home, work? Is it going to go with them to all three places? And then we look at the tasks that that student is trying to complete. So do they need help with reading? Are they struggling with spelling and need more support in that area? Are they looking for uh, recreational items to help with play? Um, and then we're going to look at the tools after we've looked at the first three, which is student environment and tasks. So again, we never start with the tool. We look at the student and that individual first, and then look at the tools that are there to best fit their needs. All right, and for the set framework, there are some resources um, at the end of the PowerPoint as well that can um, serve as a guide or um, help you through that consideration process. And through um, our TIKES project here at the Pacer Simon Technology Center, which was a federally funded um, grant that focused on increasing the use of assistive technology in early childhood, um, we developed a child-centered AT plan. And although we developed this for an early childhood audience, it can definitely be used um, throughout um, the K through um, 21 system as well. So it can, um, has three parts. It has a consideration flow chart which is really a visual planning guide. Um, and so um, the links, oh, let me go back for a second. All of these documents that are going to be on the next slides can be found um, at the link that's on this slide. And then there is also um, a slide at the end of your PowerPoint um, where you can find um, the same documents that have been created um, for a K through 21 on audience as well. So the visual planning guide um, walks you through the process of consideration and asks some questions and then based on how you answer those questions leads to a possible outcome and then how you could document that decision. And then um, if you're going to the second um, document called the Child Centered AT Plan and it's really that documentation guide. So you've gone through the flow chart and you've come up with um, an outcome and then it gives you an idea of what you, how you could document that decision in either um, the IFSP or the IEP. So there are two versions of this, one for the IFSP and one for the IEP. They are very similar. Um, they mostly just differ um, in language and um, where you might document um, depending on which um, IFSP or IEP you're using because um, they are different. Um, so this guide um, allows you to really document the decision that the team made so that you're all on the same page and then gives you a guide to where you could um, document that. And so this is just the back page of the Child Centered AT Plan. It's just a two-page document. So, And then the expanded Child Centered AT Plan, um, one for the IFSP and one for the IEP, is the third document we created. And this is really more of an in-depth um, consideration and documentation guide. Um, if your team is new to considering assistive technology and you want more of a 
step-by-step -step, um, guide through the process, or if you have a child who has complex needs and you really want to um, dive in um, and have some um, in-depth discussions about their needs, this can be helpful. So it really goes through their current AT use and areas of need, um, what AT you're going to trial with the student, um, how you're going to train um, both the student and any individuals who work with the student, how to use the device or the tool, um, who's going to set up and maintain a device. Um, and a backup plan is really important because if you're using um, a high-tech communication device like the Accent that I showed you a little bit ago, um, what happens if the battery dies or it gets thrown across the room and the screen cracks or it's just not working? Um, that can be a student's voice, so how, what are you going to do if it's not available? Um, so thinking through your backup plan and what is plan B um, is really important. And then it goes through assigning roles so everyone knows what they're doing and then also documenting those decisions. And so that was a really quick run through, but if you go um, to the link on the slide, um, you'll go to our Tykes website and we have some uh, resources there that will go more in depth to um, all of those four. Mm -hmm. And I have a question that are the forms free? Yes, the forms are free to download and they're all on the website as well. Um, so you can download and print them out um, and use them. Mm -hmm. All right, and we've kind of alluded to this, but we like to really um, be specific and point it out that considering AT is everyone's responsibility. So sometimes if a student needs a communication device, everyone thinks, oh, that's the speech language pathologist's responsibility. But really everyone on the team is an important piece of the puzzle and they have something important to contribute. And so it's everyone's responsibility because that student who's using a communication device doesn't just interact with the speech language pathologist, they interact with everyone um, in their environment, their parents, their teacher, other therapists, other related service providers. Um, so everyone would, should be able to use um, and interact with the device as well. So we have another question coming in and the question is, is Voice Dream Reader only iOS? Um, there is an Android version of Voice Dream Reader as well, so you can get it on both platforms. Sorry, did I cut you off? No, you're okay. Good. <laughs> okay, so another bigger piece to this too is assistive technology assessments. So an assessment is a formal evaluation that looks at that student and um, bases recommendations for technology based on uh, the needs of the student and the areas that they need more support in. Um, and an assessment is needed at any time. So a parent can request that evaluation be done through the school, or if the student is over 18, that student can also request for an AT evaluation. If the team can't find any devices or strategies um, to meet the needs or goals of the student, they can also do an AT evaluation. Um, or if they've done previous um, AT trials and they haven't um, been resulted, I guess, in <laughs> something that is um, a definite tool that they can use, they can also go through an AT assessment and start that process as well. So uh, with AT assessments, there are a variety of different organizations that do provide assistive technology assessments. Um, one of them is the school. That's usually the number one go-to for AT assessments. There are other organizations um, like Gillette, Courage, uh, Learning Disability Association of Minnesota also does. So those are organizations here in Minnesota, but you can, there are yeah. um, definitely organizations um, in your area too that mm -hmm. you can find too. Yeah, that's a great addition. Sorry I wasn't specific on that. Um, we also provide free consultations here at the Simon Technology Center, but keep in mind that those consultations are not a formal assessment, so we can't formally recommend that a student uses a device, but we can at least give you the options and do an informal exploration of assistive technology. Yeah, I think that actually goes on to the next yeah. slide. So an <laughs> that's okay. Uh, so another component of this too is loan programs. So after you've gone through that assessment and you figured out what tool is right for a student, um, usually there's a trial that the team does with that student to make sure that that device is a good fit for them. And there's a variety of different ways that you can get assistive technology in order to do that trial. 
Um, in Minnesota, we have the Minnesota STAR program. So that's Minnesota's state assistive technology program. And in every state, there should be a state assistive technology program. Um, we do have, we have our listing. Do we have that on our handout at all? Um, I, I don't believe it's on the handout, but I believe if you, I think it's ataap.org, it's the assistive, assistive Technology Act Program's website. Um, there you can, um, there's a drop down menu and you can put, put in your state and it should give you um, the name of the program in your state. Yeah. And just to reiterate too, that is available in every state. So you can use that website to find the state assistive technology program in your area. Um, and that's a really great way to figure out what assistive technology um, or to do those trials to make sure that it's a good fit for that student. Another component of this too is that we do have an AT reuse page. Uh, we do have a buy and sell Facebook group and we're connecting people who are seeking assistive technology to people who are um, looking to get rid of pieces that they either no longer use or their child has outgrown. Um, so again, we're just hoping that all of this assistive technology is continuously getting recycled and being put into hands of people who um, are in need of it. So it is uh, a closed group. So when you do find the Facebook page, you do have to ask to be invited into the group. And once you're invited and accepted, um, you can post uh, assistive technology or respond to people who are also uh, giving away assistive technology. And this group um, is mostly Minnesota specific, but there are other um, resources in other states for AT reuse as well. So um, if you're not local here, um, there are other resources as well. Mm -hmm. And one more question came in too. Uh, this question is, how does Voice Dream Reader compare to Google Read Write, CoWriter, or Solo Suite? <laughs> so with Voice Dream Reader, um, this is an iPad only, well, an iPad and an Android app. So it's not something that you can get on your computer. Um, some of the features cross. So with Voice Dream Reader, it's mostly text to speech and changing those visual settings on the app. Uh, read and Write for Google is very similar. It does provide text-to-speech. Um, with Read and Write for Google, you can read um, documents in Google Drive and websites. Um, Voice Dream Reader does not have any component to help with writing, so it doesn't do word prediction at all. It more specifically does text-to-speech. And. Um, I kind of think of it as voice, if you took voice dream writer, reader and co-writer together, that would give you some of the similar features of Google Read and Write. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. All right, and then um, to wrap up, we just wanna um, talk about presuming competence and that we're really um, having high expectations for all of these students and that uh, we're going to presume that they can do things and so that we just need to find um, the tool that can help them um, show their ability so that we so that we can um, they can have access to their education the com community um, and really opportunity and experience um, everything um, that they can and so that they have limitless possibilities because if we presume competence then that perception drives expectation and so that if um, we kind of follow that deficit model of, oh, they can't do this, then that also drives our expectations of what they can do. So having those high expectations, um, we're giving them more opportunity and, have, and giving them the opportunity to achieve all that they can, and then, dri again, drive that perception of, that they're competent and that we have high expectations for them. So the last few slides that we have in our PowerPoint are more um, resources, and I know we're a couple of minutes over, so I think we'll let you guys explore some of these resources for SET on your own. Um, we do have more information about the Child-Centered AT plan as well, and then also a couple of uh, Pinterest links in case you wanted to follow us on Pinterest or see what kinds of boards we've created for assistive technology. So with that, I think we'll leave it open to questions in the last couple of minutes. And before you guys log out, 
uh, please make sure that you fill out an evaluation. We will give you a certificate of attendance with mm -hmm. that as well. Um, so with that, thank you so much for joining us and we hope you enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you. All right, and if there aren't any questions, um, we will sign off. And um, if you have any questions afterwards, please feel free to email us at stc.psr.org or one of our personal emails, and we'll be happy to answer your question. Thank you.